before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the CLSA National Coordinating Center and McMaster University are located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee Nations and within the lands protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Uh, Simon Fraser University, where today's presenters are based, is situated on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Salatooth, and Musqueam Nations. So as attendees of this webinar, I encourage you to continue your learning following the webinar and to acknowledge the original inhabitants of the land where we currently have the privilege to research, live and work, wherever that may be. Okay, so before we begin, uh, I just want to review a couple of housekeeping items. Um, everyone but the presenters will be muted throughout the webinar. If you need to change or test your audio during the webinar, you can click audio settings on the bottom of the Zoom window. At the end of the today's presentation, there'll be a question and answer session. If you have a question for the presenters during the webinar, you can post it in the Q&A box uh, located at the bottom of the toolbar. Uh, quest all, uh, you can enter questions anytime, but all questions will be addressed at the very end of the webinar. Uh, when you submit a question, it will be visible to all attendees. Uh, finally, a feedback survey will be launched at the end of the webinar, and we invite you to complete it after exiting the Zoom session. This brief survey provides us with important feedback we can use to plan future CLSA webinars. Okay, so today's webinar is entitled Exploring Relationships Between Social Isolation and Cognitive Change in the CLSA. Uh, the presentation will be given by Shauna Hopper and Dr. John Best, who are both of Simon Fraser University. So Shauna Hopper is completing her PhD in the Department of Gerontology at SFU. Her doctoral work aims to examine longitudinal associations between social isolation and loneliness and indicators of well-being. Uh, Dr. Best is a university research associate in the Gerontology Research Center at Simon Fraser University. His research explores the interconnections among health behavior, mental, sorry, health behavior, mental health, and neurocognition across the lifespan. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing now, and I will turn it over to Dr. Best. Uh, thanks so much, Laura, and thanks for, for everyone at CLSA working um, behind the scenes to put on this webinar series. Um, Shauna and I are delighted to uh, be given the opportunity to, to, to share our research here. So I'm going to speak um, quite briefly to give an overview, um, and kind of situate the, the current CLSA study, and then I'm, I'm going to hand it over to Shauna, who, who spearheaded um, the work we're going to talk about. Okay, Shauna, if you'll go to the next slide. Um, so this, we'll focus on, uh, on this paper here um, that's, that was published back in 2023. Um, so that's available to, to anyone interested in, in, in having that and seeing that. Um, the other thing I'd like to acknowledge on this slide is the, the funding that um, allowed us to complete this research. So this was um, provided through a project grant from CIHR, and in particular, the Healthy Cities Research Initiative that uh, allowed for analysis of existing data, data sets. And, and so the CLSA was, a, was an excellent uh, uh, data source to uh, address some of the questions we're interested in here. Okay, if you'll go to the next slide. So. Um, I want to start um, with a kind of a high level situation of, of, of the research here. And so uh, this research um, really starts with the, with the premise that there is a, a connection between our physical bodies and the activity we perform with our physical bodies and our cognitive and brain health. Um, now, of course, this isn't, um, this isn't really a novel idea the, the idea that um, a sound mind resides in a sound body um, has its origins millennia ago um, and has been acknowledged since then. I'd say it's been in the last 30 or so years that um, the, the connections between physical health, um, physical activity and brain and cognition um, have been studied rigorously and kind of scientifically um, again, has been in the last 30 or so years. Um, a big portion of that research um, has been experimental research with rodents um, and has led to landmark findings such as the, the finding that um, rodents that are allowed free will running, um, this induces neurogenesis in the hippocampus of the brain, um, which is a, an essential area for learning and memory. 
And um, at the same time, there's been research in humans, um, especially in older adults, um, using observational study designs or randomized control trial designs um, that have shown that being active or you know, engaging in, a, um, in exercise programs, and these are typically kind of brisk walking programs, so aerobic-based exercise, can be beneficial to the cognitive health of older adults, um, as well as, as shows up in, in certain neurocognitive signatures or neuroimaging signatures, so uh, volumetric uh, findings, um, for example. Um, it was about 10 years ago that um, Kirk Erickson and some of his colleagues kind of gave a name to this field of study, and they gave it the name health neuroscience, and, and this kind of um, cartoon here is intended to kind of summarize that, which um, is looking at the interconnections between physical health and, and health behavior and, and cogn cognition and brain health. Um, one of the things I like to point out about this, um, about this slide and, 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 and was hypothesized by Erickson and his colleagues is that this arrow, as you can see, goes in both directions. Um, now, typically when we think about this, the, we think about the arrow going from physical health um, and health behaviors toward cognition. So we think that physical activity can be beneficial to the cognition and brain health of, of individuals. Um, it, but it's also possible that the arrow goes in the opposite direction as well. So it's probably a back and forth sort of situation so that um, you know, our, our, our cognitive capacities are important for determining the types of health behaviors that we, that we engage in. Now, in the, in the current talk, we're, we're probably going to focus on that, that former association from physical health and physical activity to um, cognition and brain health. But I, I do like to acknowledge that it, it is possible that it goes in both directions here. Okay, Sean, if you'll go to the next slide here. Okay, um, now um, this next slide, what I'm intending to show here is that um, it, it's it's not quite as simple as, as the former slide where we just have this back and forth between cognition and, and health behavior. Um, but it uh, it's, can be informative and useful if we think about this in, in a larger and perhaps a bit more uh, complex uh, picture here. So we still have the kind of the cognition in that blue um, circle or oval, and then we have health behavior in the, in the yellow here, but we have uh, many other things here. Um, I won't um, go into detail about all of this, but um, for example, when we think about health behavior, we, one of those key things is physical activity, but other things of importance are diet um, and sleep. Um, cognition, I've already kind of touched on this, but um, we have our you know, cognitive performance, but we also have the underlying um, brain function and brain structure that we can measure. Um, with respect to determinants of health behaviors, there's certainly emotional and motivational factors, and then our, and our intentions that should be considered. Um, and, then, and then finally, this is kind of all situated within this uh, environment, the, the green in the background here. And, and, and so in, in the paper that we're gonna talk about today, we really bring in the environment um, in thinking about how, um, physical activity is related to cognitive health. And, um, and so environment can be things such as the built environment in which we live, but um, it can also be the, um, the social environment um, and the social connections that we have. So, so I'll hand it over to Shauna now, but um, just to summarize here. So it, in this paper, we're interested in, in looking at the associations between physical activity and cognitive health while also bringing in the influence of the, um, the social environment. Perfect. Thanks, John. So just giving a bit more context, um, as, as everyone on this call probably knows, we are getting older and not just as individuals, but also as a population. So this graph here shows that we're currently in the midst of a tremendous demographic change with individuals over 65 representing approximately 15% of our population in 2010, but nearly 25% of our population by 2040. And of course, getting older is not necessarily a bad thing on its own, but it does have some costs. One of those being being at an increased risk of social isolation. So in recent years, social isolation has in gained increased recognition as a critical public health issue. 
And this is both within Canada and around the globe. And older adults experience the highest levels of social isolation. It's believed that nearly one in five Canadians, 65 years and older, lack companionship. And nearly one third of older Canadians are at risk of being socially isolated. Older adults tend to be at a greater risk due to various circumstances that limit their social contact, such as age-related health declines, environmental factors, life events and transitions, such as family moving away or the death of a loved one, lack of awareness of available community programs, as well as low socioeconomic status. And this is a really big concern because social isolation is associated with many negative health outcomes, and these include psychological well-being, so mental health, um, physical health, such as hypertension, as well as just overall quality of life. And I would say that this has always been a recognized problem. Um, people did always think social isolation was an issue. Um, for example, a report was commissioned by the federal government regarding social isolation of seniors um, in, 20, um, in 2010. And then in 2013 and 2014, the National Seniors Council also produced reports on social isolation in older adults. And by 2017, the Federal and Provincial and Territorial Working Group on Social Isolation developed toolkits um, that were used by service providers, organizations, and social networks. But in 2020, when COVID hit, this has obviously became such a bigger topic of conversation, um, and it forced us to pay a lot closer attention to older adults that were being socially isolated. So these are just some news headlines um, from the last few years, but there's so many more than this. So what is social isolation? Um, social isolation is defined as a lack of quantity and quality of social contacts, and it, imbues, it involves few social contacts and few social roles, as well as the absence of mutually rewarding relationships. So it's typically measured using things such as the number of social contacts you have, the frequency that you're interacting with them, the amount of support you either receive or you feel like you could receive, and so on. And as I previously mentioned, it is associated with many negative health outcomes, such as diminished cognition and increased risk of dementia, reduced physical activity, which we'll see today, greater sedentary time, increased risk of hypertension, and an overall increased risk of mortality. But occurring alongside this global social isolation crisis is the global increase in dementia prevalence, so worldwide, there's nearly 7.7 .7 million new cases of dementia each year. And with the aging global population, um, the prevalence of dementia is expected to continue to increase. So this graph here shows the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias in British Columbia in 2009 and 2010. So you can see the younger folks are on the left and as you move towards the right, it gets older. So 65 all the way up to 85 and older. And it's clear that as you age, the risk for dementia increases dramatically. And this is just BC because that's where we are located, um, but similar trends can be seen across Canada and across North America. So when you put together this increase in dementia as we age, as well as our aging population, you can see that there is this strong age associated increase. So we can project this. So John had put this together, on the left, he plotted um, the projected annual incidence for Alzheimer's disease and other dementias between 2011 and 2031. And on the right is the annual prevalence, so the new cases. Um, and these bars are raw numbers and the lines are the rate for 100,000 persons. So clearly we can expect dementia incidence and prevalence to rise steadily. And so it's important for us to better understand the risk factors for dementia beyond, of course, just aging, because we can't stop that. Um, and this is to be able to identify interventions and promote cognitive and brain health, in turn, reducing dementia risk. So our goal was to understand the relationship with um, physical activity, as well as socialization, to see if there's a way to intervene there. So how is this all linking together, leading us to our study today? Evidence has started to suggest that there is a negative association between social isolation and cognitive health, such that older adults who are more isolated would experience larger decreases in cognitive abilities. Unfortunately, interventions that directly target social isolation to improve cognition 
have only demonstrated small effect sizes. So we need to intervene somewhere else. Social isolation has also been associated with reduced physical activity. So those who are more isolated most likely spend more time being sedentary. And other research suggests that there's a positive association between physical activity and cognition. John mentioned this earlier. So those who um, exercise more often may have protective benefits for their cognition and those who are maybe more sedentary might see a more rapid decline. So we were looking at the literature around all of this and we found that the current literature on interventions targeting social isolation to improve cognition show small effect sizes. Therefore, we thought that maybe we could find evidence that interventions targeting physical activity instead might be more beneficial. Um, to our knowledge, there were no studies that had been done that looked at these three variables together, specifically performing a mediation analysis like we did. Um, so looking at the, the path from social isolation to physical activity to cognition. Also, most studies are limited by a small sample size and a non-Canadian sample. Um, so luckily we had access to this amazing data through the CLSA that has over 50,000 participants, all from Canada. And lastly, lots of the research doesn't consider the differences between age groups, um, kind of lumping all older adults together. Um, and they might not make look at the differences between males and females. And we do know that there are differences in socialization patterns and physical activity and cognition between males and females. So we wanted to address that in our research. So, like I said, we were interested in the path from social isolation to physical activity to cognition. So the objectives were to evaluate the associations between social isolation and a change in cognition over a three-year period. And our second objective was to evaluate whether physical activity mediates the association between social isolation and cognitive change. So to do this, we used data from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. Um, I'm sure if you're all in this webinar, you kind of know the basics of the CLSA. But just a quick overview, it is a large national study with over 50,000 participants at baseline. Baseline data collection began in 2011 with subsequent data collections every three years. Um, at the time of recruitment, individuals were between the ages of 45 and 85. And there's two different cohorts within the CLSA. There's the tracking cohort, which participates in telephone questionnaires. And then there's the comprehensive cohort, which undergoes face-to-face in-home interviews, as well as kind of in-depth data collections at data collection sites across Canada. So the black dots you can see are where we have participants doing the telephone interviews, and then these green um, spots are the data collection sites where you'd have the comprehensive cohort come in. So for this analysis, we did use data from baseline and follow-up one, so with three-year gap between those two data collection points, and we used both the tracking and comprehensive cohorts we retained the entire baseline sample, which was amazing. So we had a total of 51,338 participants included in our analysis. Um, the exposure in our analysis is social isolation, but the CLSA does not directly measure social isolation. So we had to compute a social isolation score and we used the social isolation index, which was created by Worcester and colleagues, one of our co-authors on this paper. The social isolation index includes structural objective measures such as community participation, social network and marital status. It also then includes functional objective measures such as social support. And it includes functional subjective measures such as loneliness and an individual's desire to participate in more activities. So there was lots of math involved in this, but Overall, each of these three sections had a score. They were added up and divided by three, which left us with scores ranging from zero to 10 with higher scores indicating greater social isolation. Our mediator um, was physical activity, um, which is measured using the physical activity scale for the elderly or the PACE scale. This scale provides a score based on frequency of activities. So how many hours per day they did the activity over the past seven days multiplied by the activity's pace weight, which is determined based off its intensity. So more intense activities are weighted greater. 
Um, this scale is specifically designed for people over the age of 65, and it includes a large array of activities ranging from strenuous sports and endurance exercises to light housework and gardening. So the higher the score, the more active a participant is. We had two different outcomes, um, which you'll see when we go through our results. So we wanted to look at different types of measures of cognition. So we looked at executive function using scores from the animal fluency test and the mental alterations test. So these are both standard tests to measure executive function. Animal fluency involves a participant naming as many distinct animals as possible in a 60 second period. And the mental alterations test involves alternating between letters and numbers. So 1A, 2B, um, as quickly as possible in a 30 second period and then getting a score. We were also interested in memory. So to measure memory, a composite score was calculated based on two Ray auditory verbal learning tests. So this test requires participants to listen to a list of 15 words and then immediately recall them within a 90 second period. Then they go back and they do the executive function tests. And after that, they're asked to recall these words again. So like five or 10 minutes later, and this produces two different scores between zero and 15, depending on how many words they recalled. So we added those together for an overall score between zero and 30. And I'll pass this back to John. Yeah, so um, so when Sean and I first started talking about this project, um, uh, I guess many, few, several years ago now, but um, I mentioned that I, I thought it'd be a good idea that we um, apply a structural equation modeling framework to the data and to the analyses. Um, the, um, kind of blessing in, in the curse of uh, structural equation modeling is, is that we need to specify a, a measurement model. Um, we oftentimes take this for granted when we do analyses, um, but here we have to we have to make that explicit and then we can get um, fit indices to, to kind of tell us, you know, how far off we are. Um, one of the good things is, is that the, um, the members of the Cognition CLSA working group had, had done a lot of the formative work and so we could base a lot of it on that. Um, but as Sean had mentioned, we have these four measures that are, are available to us in both the, um, the comprehensive and the tracking cohorts. And so the idea is how do these things fit together? Um, and as Sean had already um, uh, presaged here, we have executive function measures and we have memory measures. So, so we can create this model in which we kind of group them in that way. And so that's what this is showing here. So, kind of the top of the screen here, you can see a, a circle that says W1EF. So that would be wave one executive function. Um, and that is comprised of the fluency score and the mental alternations test at wave one. So we can think of this kind of latent executive function ability um, that would lead to different performances on fluency and, and, and the mental alternations. Um, and so that's, that's what we have there. And then of course we can do the same thing at, at, at wave two, the executive functioning and computer score. Um, and I'll come back uh, to the little Delta EF in a second. And then we do the same thing with the memory. So um, memory is comprised of the immediate and long-term um, uh, memory performances at, at both of those waves. Okay, so we have our latent scores at, um, at, at wave one and wave two and what we're really interested in here is is this short term cognitive decline, and we can we can also um, measure that in this kind of fancy latent ability. But frankly, it's just a change score. So if we look at um, the difference between, for example, the latent EF score at wave one and the latent EF score at wave two, you can compute a, a, a change or a, a delta that leads wave one to end up in, as wave two. Um, and so those are those, if you see the Delta EF and the Delta MEM for memory, um, that's what those represent. It's just a, a simple change score there. Um, this, uh, to give it a name, is, is described as a latent change score model. Um, and as Shauna hinted at, we can, um, we can include all the participants, uh, regardless of the amount of missing data they have using um, maximum likelihood estimation. And then when it comes to our um, exogenous variables and our covariates, we can also model those as, as random variables that, that further allows us to include all the participants. And so we get the full uh, 51,000 in, in change for all our, our analyses. Um, 
okay, I'll, I think that's enough for that. Um, and so that latent change score model kind of forms the basis of a bit more complicated model. And I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the full diagram here and, and give this cartoon representation. Um, and so uh, the blue circle there, the delta EF, the delta memory, that comes from that previous slide and, and, and that measurement model. And um, that forms the basis of a, a mediation model where, as Shauna has already described, we have social exposure, or sorry, social isolation as our exposure. And it is theorized that um, social isolation has a direct impact on cognitive decline uh, in the domains of executive function and memory. Um, and that would be through path C, so the direct effect. Um, but of particular interest to us is it would also have an indirect effect. And this occurs in part through, um, through physical activity. So social isolation influences physical activity and in turn physical activity uh, levels would influence the uh, amount of cognitive decline. And um, we can quantify this kind of indirect effect or oftentimes referred to as a mediation effect by multiplying the values of path A and path B. Um, and so that becomes a mediation effect. Uh, and we of course have uh, several things we want to co-vary for in these analyses. And those are summarized there in the, the upper right-hand box that we have. So we have demographic factors. Um, we have other health behaviors that might be confounding. Um, physical health, certainly um, body mass index, multimorbidity that might have a, a direct influence on one's physical activity levels. And then we have what I've uh, called here nuisance variables. Um, so these are you know, more study specific things like um, the language, whether it was completed in French or English or the cohort from which the person comes, the comprehensive versus the tracking cohort. And then the last thing I wanna say is that um, we, have, um, we, have, we have conducted these analyses within four subgroups. Um, and, and those four subgroups make up the four combinations of age, um, split at age 65. So 45 to 64 year olds versus 65 plus and biological sex. Um, as determined at baseline. Um, so male versus female. So we have the, the four combination of those two things. Uh, okay, that's all right, thanks. Um, um, one, more, one more slide for me. Um, before we get to the, to, the, to the kind of the juicy findings here, um, I want to, uh, this slide shows you um, those delta EF and those delta memory scores. So what they look like, and this is important in kind of interpreting our associations that we'll, we'll talk about here in a bit. So we didn't know what happens on, on in general with respect to cognitive decline before we can understand how physical activity and social isolation um, might impact that decline. Um, and so in that um, top row um, blue, this is, these are distributions of change scores in executive function. So if we look across all our participants, um, we can kind of make a, we can, we can show the shape of that change. Um, and the dashed uh, vertical line represent, is, is shown at zero. So any um, scores below zero would be a decline uh, from baseline. And then of course, anything to the right would be a, a, an improvement. And so what we're interested in is how those distribution, distributions look relative to the, those dashed lines. And you can see here that the kind of the mass of the distribution or the, the majority of the, of the participants are to the left. So that is not surprising to us. Um, and that just is, is simply tells us that executive functioning uh, tends to decrease from baseline to, to, to follow up one or wave one to wave two is another way to say that. Um, and you can see we have this for our four combinations. Um, perhaps not surprising is that the, the degree of decline is a, is a bit stronger for the older age groups. Um, and I believe it's a slightly stronger for, for males versus females. Uh, no, sorry, I think for executive function that difference isn't uh, isn't apparent. It's going to be in the memory. Sorry. Um, so uh, uh, going down to the memory in green here, we see a, um, the, the same type of data shown, but you can see the pattern looks a bit different. And this is kind of interesting here. So rather than having the mass of the distribution being um, to the left of those dashed lines, it's actually kind of centered right at it, or in some case, um, 
slightly to the right. Um, and so at face value, that would suggest that performance on these measures is slightly increasing. Um, this is um, this is actually something that's shown in the literature and other in other uh, longitudinal studies, and that is that it's likely uh, reflective of a test retest effect. So having previous experience with the test leads one to perform better, and so that's a kind of a, a, a kind of a natural artifact of longitudinal studies, especially when over a relatively short um, um, period of follow up. Um, but of course, uh, what's of interest really is the kind of the individual variation. So we have people who are making large improvements and then we have people who are declining. So uh, I'll turn it over to Shauna now, but what we're really interested in is understanding the individual variation um, in these decline and what can predict that. Great. <clears throat> so getting on to our results, um, again, just kind of setting you up to understand what you're looking at here. Um, like John said, um, this dashed line represents no association, so it's at the zero. Um, so we're interested in looking at different estimates, um, which are the dots in the picture here, um, as well as the measures of uncertainty. So how sure are we that that estimate is actually correct? There's always gonna be some level of uncertainty. So those are those bars that extend from the dots. So we want, to have significant results and those results would be where the dot and the entire bar do not overlap that dashed line because the dashed line means that there is no association. So this first image was path A. So that is the path from social isolation to physical activity levels. So as we expected, increased social isolation was associated with decreased physical activity in all of the age groups and both genders. So the black bar here, we have the younger age group of females. The yellow is the younger age group of males. The blue is the older age group of females and the green is the older age group of males. Um, so when you look at this, you can see that um, obviously the um, younger age groups have um, a bit less of an association here. But what's really interesting about this one is that um, the association is stronger in both of the male groups. So that's that yellow bar and that green bar. So they're further away from zero. Um, so this means that um, males who are socially isolated are gonna see a greater decline on their physical activity in comparison to females. So that was kind of an interesting finding here. Moving on to path B. So again, the path from physical activity to cognitive decline. We now have two different graphs because we do have executive function on the left memory on the right. So um, we found that physical activity was positively associated with executive function change in older males, as seen on the left, and then in older, um, and then on memory, the graph on the right, change was, memory change was associated, um, sorry, physical activity was associated with memory change in both older males and older females. So this means individuals who participate in physical activity slow show slightly larger increases in memory or executive function over time. So they most likely are either not improving at all or slightly improving over time if you do participate in physical activity. And as you can see, it is only the older groups that are not crossing this line um, for executive function. The older females do cross the line, so that wouldn't be considered statistically significant. But for the younger groups, we do not find the same association um, since it does overlap that dashed line. So for older adults, it is important to participate in physical activity to protect against cognitive decline. But we just don't see quite the same association at that younger age range. And we'll talk about that a bit later, too. We also have that direct path. So from social isolation to cognitive decline. Um, and it was quite interesting because for this one, we pretty much don't see any significant associations, which is not exactly what the literature says. Um, a lot of literature does show that those who are more socially isolated would have a greater decline in cognition over time. Um, but the only thing that was significant in this model was um, older females who are soci socially isolated um, had a greater change in memory over time. Um, so that was quite interesting and is something probably to look more into um, with more waves of CLSA data. 
But really what we were here to talk about and what's, what is of most interest to us is this mechanism to which social isolation impacts cognitive decline through physical activity. So this is what we call path D, or as John had said, it's multiplying path A and path B to see this impact. So the indirect effects of social isolation on cognition through physical activity were evident in males 65 and older for executive function. So the only one that's not crossing the line here is this green bar on the bottom left. And then in males and females for memory change. So on the right, both that blue and green bar. So these same effects were not observed for the adults 45 to 65 year old um, for executive function or memory change. So there's a few different reasons why this might have happened. It's possible that the middle-aged brain is less sensitive to the effects of social isolation. So maybe if you're socially isolated at that age, it's just not impacting you as much. Or they might be less sensitive to the beneficial effects of physical activity. So maybe it's that as you get older, the impact of physical activity is just more significant on cognition. The other potential explanation is that the impacts of social isolation on cognitive health may just accumulate over years or over decades. So we just might not be detecting it um, at that younger age group, the 45 to 64. So it just might not be detectable until later in life, but it might still be having that impact just further down the line. So what have we learned today? <laughs> um, with an aging population, both social isolation and cognitive decline are issues that need to be addressed in order to maintain health in Canada. This study showed that there's an association between social isolation and memory decline in older adults with the clearance, clearest evidence supporting an association between social isolation and short-term memory in adults over 65. Further, this effect is mediated by physical activity. We found that the association between social isolation and physical activity is stronger in males compared to females, which is interesting. And although cognitive decline may be a downstream effect of social isolation, it's clear that focusing on interventions such as physical activity interventions that maybe have a social aspect will have a positive impact on maintaining the future health of our communities. Our, res our results suggest that interventions targeting physical act inactivity might be one method to protect against cognitive decline for older adults that experience social isolation. Specifically, like I said, physical activity programs that include social components might have this like further bolstered effect on cognition and reduce social isolation at the same time. But more research should really be done to better understand the effects of these multimodal interventions. So the combination of physical activity and socializing together. And the study is not without its limitations. Um, one of the big limitations of this study um, and with using some of these big data sets is the use of self-report measures. Um, so the biggest one being physical activity, we didn't have them wear you know, a tracking device to see you know, what kind of activities they were doing and things like that. And um, we just asked, they just got asked in the last seven days, what did you do? Um, so maybe they couldn't quite remember what they did in the last seven days, but also a lot of self-report data introduces social desirability bias. So especially with physical activity, lots of people will overestimate what they did. Um, furthermore, our model considers that social isolation and physical activity impact cognition. So John mentioned this earlier, we looked at the direction only in one way, um, but it's also likely that this association is dynamic and reciprocal, meaning that, you know, someone with decreased cognition may also have an impact on their socialization habits or their physical activity habits. So we did only look at one direction, but there is chances that this goes both ways. And lastly, um, causal interpretation of effects relies on the assumption of sequential ignorability. So basically to know that this is truly an association and a causal relationship, we would need to intervene with people. So again, John mentioned all these rat studies that have been done. Um, so for example, you know, intervening to make someone more or less socially isolated in combination with doing more or less physical activity then we could see if this is actually a causal relationship, but obviously we can't do that and we don't wanna do that. Um, so we did control for all those confounding variables on that first slide, um, but yes, we can't say that this is a causal relationship.
And then just quickly to mention where we go from here. Um, so this was a research project that John had um, thought up and got some funding for, but it is kind of the basis of starting my PhD work. Um, so my PhD work, I do wanna look at that bi-directional relationship. So like I mentioned, it is possible that someone who has cognitive decline that might lead them to being less social or participating in less physical activity. So I wanna run some analyses to kind of look at that relationship and see which direction it is going in or which direction is stronger. Also, so exciting, when we started this project, CLSA only had two waves of data available um, and now they have three and they're collecting the fourth. So again, running this with more waves of data, we can look at you know some of those longer term associations and see if these patterns are consistent over time and over a longer period. Um, so I'll be looking into that as well. This is just one data set in Canada and it is phenomenal, but we do want to see if the same types of associations are seen in other data sets. So maybe in a US sample or in like a German sample to see if the same things are happening in other places. So yeah, that is everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, we will now open it up to the Q&A, and I see there are quite a few questions that have come in. Um, so just a reminder to everyone um, on the webinar that muting will remain on, but you can still continue to enter questions into the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you have entered a question into the Q&A, um, I would just suggest you move it over to the, uh, sorry, into the chat box, I would just suggest you move it over to the Q&A. Okay, so we'll get started. So um, I see that Julia had a couple of questions here for you. Uh, so I will, I'll, I'll read one and then um, we'll move to the next one. So were you able to look at accessibility of physical activity opportunities? So for example, cost, location, safety, urban versus rural, et cetera. Just curious. Um, yeah, no. Oh. <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead. Not, not necessarily, so we couldn't, we did. Um, we did control for rural versus urban um, where people lived. Um, but I think one positive of the pay scale is that it does include so many different activities um, that don't necessarily need to be done like in a gym setting or in a um, kind of organized setting. Um, so for things like that, because like gardening and housework and maintenance and things are included, there are ways for that physical activity level to be a bit higher. Um, yeah, John, I don't know, you can add, but unfortunately, yeah, we could control for urban and rural, we controlled for socioeconomic status. Um, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add there. No, oh, no, nothing, nothing to add to that. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, okay, so again, another question from Julia. I'm really curious as to what impact sleep quality, hormones, et cetera, have on executive function and memory. I mean, I, I know some research I could point you to. There's some researchers at UBC that do a lot of um, research on sleep quality and physical activity and how that impacts cognition. And they use CLSA data, which is great. Um, so yeah, I'd be happy to share some of those resources. But um, for this specific study, um, yeah, we didn't take into consideration sleep quality. Um, I, I think, yeah, partly because there isn't much literature on how sleep um, and hormone impact social isolation, and that was kind of our main focus here. Right, um, and I, I should say too that um, if uh, the CLSA website has um, publications on a variety of different topics, so I know with certainty that there are some that have been done on sleep there from um, a variety of institutions. So. Um, great. Okay, so the next question is from Margaret, um, and she asks, why are gerontologists and government recommending that seniors continue to live on their, in their own homes when it obviously leads to social isolation? I don't know if you want to jump in, John. I mean, <laughs> just thinking off the top of my head, I, I think it, it goes both ways. Yes, of course, some older adults end up getting isolated in their own, their own homes, but also a lot of times um, they, they're really supported in their community um, and they're comfortable in their home. And um, sometimes if they have to move into long-term care, they have to leave their neighborhood and the people that you know they wave at or they pass when they go for a walk. Um, 
I was I was just up in Port Hardy on the island doing some interviews about social isolation and it was definitely very evident that those older adults did not want to have to leave their community to go into a, a home because they felt like their community was their family. Um, so I think that's part of it. I know there's lots of benefits to aging in place and aging in your own home. I don't want to get into kind of some of the, the negative issues of, of being in long-term care in this day and age, but um, yeah, I think, I think there needs to be maybe more of a focus on how we continue to support older adults that do live in their own homes. So mm-hmm. do we do wellness checks? Do we, you know, ensure that there's enough programs nearby that they can access and things like that um, to kind of counteract them ending up being socially isolated within their own home. And yeah, like it is cheaper as someone mentioned too. Uh, the cost of leaving their home is, is quite expensive. Great. Okay, so uh, we now have um, a couple of questions from Ermina. Um, she writes, for Path C, did you look at just the single question about social isolation from the CLSA or the score from the index? Um, we used the, the score um, because there isn't actually a single question about social isolation. There's a loneliness measure. Um, but loneliness and social isolation, as we know, are, are quite different and have different impacts on overall well-being and health. Um, so, yeah, we did use the score from the index for all of the paths in this model. Okay. And she also asks, is it possible that in time from baseline to follow up, cognitive decline is not yet detectable? So, for example, people in their 40s. And then um, Mark Aramis comments, we have found this in our studies because the CLSA recruited a cognitively mm-hmm. healthy sample at baseline. Yeah, no, of course. I mean, Mark, Mark said it there. And also just uh, there is lots of research that uses longitudinal studies that show like three years just isn't a big mm-hmm. a big gap to see this decline happening. Like you said, especially someone who's maybe 45 and then is 48. Um, so again, this is a benefit of the CLSA happening over many, many years that will have more waves and we will start to see m- more of a decline, unfortunately, in people. Um so yeah, having more waves will really help. But mm-hmm. yes, obviously the CLSA is a, a quite healthy sample just in general, um, kind of in all aspects of health. When you look at the distributions, it's it's a little bit healthier than probably what our population is, but those tend to be the people who who participate in, in studies, so. I would just add, I think there's, as we kind of hinted at before, there's a bit of a design issue too. So. Um, for anyone curious, I would I would point them to the work of, of Salthouse in, at the University of Virginia, who's done a lot of uh, nice work kind of comparing design. So if you use a cross-sectional design uh, and look at age differences, um, you'll start to see some, I mean, it's more modest, but there, there are some age-related associations beginning in the 40s. But then when you have these longitudinal designs, they, as we talked about, they kind of get washed out in some respect or, 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 we, or we suspect they, they're getting washed out um, to a degree because of the practice effects. Um, so there's that complication. Okay. Uh, so our next question is uh, from Mr. Avon. He says, uh, please explain once again how physical activity was defined and measured in your analysis. Yeah, so the CLSA uses the PACE score, so the physical activity score for the elderly. Um, and it uh, looks at the frequency of participating in different activities um, in the last seven days. And the reason it is seven days is so that older adults can remember um, versus some scores that use over the last month. Um, so there's a bunch of different activities. They are asked how many hours um, per day in the last seven days they did them. Um, and then the activity is kind of weighted. So the less intense activities such as maybe gardening or housework are weighted less. And then doing, you know, brisk walking to running to weightlifting is weighted more. Um, yeah, so it ends up in a, a score that's kind of pretty varied depending on the person um, with a higher score being more physically active. Great. Uh, so another question from Mark Aramis. Uh, did you use SEM to conduct the mediation analysis? And what were the time points of your mm-hmm. X, Y, and M variables? Y- yes. So we did 
we did use the structural equation modeling. So we basically built upon that latent chain score model and added all the exposures and the mediators and then specified these indirect paths. So it was built within the structural equation modeling. So um, X social isolation um, was measured at wave one, um, as was physical activity, our, our, our M, our mediator variable. So those are both measured at wave one. And then Y is defined as that change score. So it's the it's the, the, the change in the latent cognition, cognition score from wave one to wave, um, to wave two. Um, and then as Sean mentioned in some of our limitations or, or certainly things to, <laughs> to keep in mind is that the, these are the, the kind of the mediation effect is relying on these assumptions. Uh, quite frankly, they're, they're the same kind of assumptions we make with um, any kind of observational study that there's no residual confounding that in order to, to give these a causal interpretation. Now it's it's kind of, um, because we're kind of looking at two paths simultaneously, we're assuming that uh, lack of residual confounding in both of those, um, both those at the same time. Great. Okay, so Armina asks again, since the PACE data is categorical, did you log transform it to meet the assumptions of the L CSM. Yeah. Interested in this, we've struggled with working uh, with this data for some of our previous work. Yeah, okay, I think I can take this one. Um, and if I understand correctly, it, so the pace is, um, I wouldn't describe it as categorical per se, when we create this overall um, score that's reflective of an intensity and duration, it, it, it is positively skewed. So you kind of have this long right tail of the super, the marathoners and the so forth. Uh, of course, people could also be overestimating the amount of this activity they, they are participating in, uh, which is kind of a, another issue. For these findings, we, we did not use to transform, but I can say that we did use a log transformation that does help normalize that distribution, and we see the same patterns of finding. But for the what we're showing here is using the untransformed um, total scores. Okay, great. So next question. Um, so Wister's uh, social isolation index combines structural and functional social support, but these two constructs are different. Having worked with Verena Menick in the past, she felt quite strongly that both types of social support should be studied separately. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I know. I don't know if John has something to say. Um, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, I think his, his index is, I mean, they, they did some research on it to ensure, you know, that it was a sound measure. Um, I, I've read a lot of Renomenics and um, research and I, I mean, without saying too much, uh, for my for my PhD work, I am going to switch to one of, um, one of the measures that she kind of computed within the CLSA that does include mm -hmm. less variables in it. Um, and is more similar to measures that are used in other studies around the world. Um, yeah, I don't, um, yeah, I think going forward, we will use that, um, obviously, because this social isolation index does include um, one of the loneliness questions. It, it has some, some pushback um, for people that work in this area, um, and the reviewers definitely questioned that. Um, since we do know that they are different things, it's kind of an interesting choice to have loneliness within the measure itself. Um, and again, the same with the social support variables in there too. But John, I don't know if you want to add. No, I think you said everything that um, uh, I can think of. Great. So now we have a question from Laura, Laura Churchill. Is there any way to capture cognitive decline without long-term data? I.e., we have an intervention that combines physical activity and social interaction for older adults, and we were uh, starting a clinical trial. What measures of cognition would be important to collect in the short and long-term to understand this relationship? I'll take a stab at that. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. So of the kind of domains of cognition, executive functioning and memory are ones that we expect to begin to decline in middle age, as I kind of talked about. And again, I'd refer people to the work of um, Salt House um, for further information. That, um, so memory and executive function are, are kind of a couple of good places to start with for measuring. Um, um, and obviously they have important um, kind of real world implications in terms of getting through one's day-to-day -day lives. Um, you know, I guess one of the issues is is how can we address the potential practice effects? So one thing that can be done is using different versions or different forms of, 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 a, of a 
of a test. So it's not um, identical to something they've seen previously. Um, I think um, also using potentially using computer-based or tablet-based assessments that allow for more like fine-grained assessments of performance um, can be, uh, could, could also work. Uh, you could measure uh, response times um, and, as well as potentially using a bit more challenging sorts of tasks, especially for like executive functioning uh, sorts of things. Anything right. else, Shauna, you would, you would add? <laughs> I think that's your domain more. <laughs> um, so I see we've just got a couple more minutes left. Um, and I did want to note that if we don't get through all the questions, um, you do have your email addresses displayed on the screen there. So um, people are welcome to reach out to you through that. Um, I should also mention we did put the link to the paper in the chat. And I don't believe it's open access. We put the link to the PubMed summary. But I'm assuming if, if people were interested, they could reach out to you as well. OK. Great. OK, so we do have a question uh, from Mark around attrition bias. So did you look at the potential effects of attrition bias on the results? Our team has found that persons with low memory scores mm -hmm. at baseline and persons who are socially isolated at baseline are more likely to drop out prior to follow up one. Yeah, that's a super question. Um, so we, we, we handle that through our um, use of the maximum likelihood estimation and the fact that we are including baseline cognitive scores in our in our model so that that um, will allow for um, uh, will address the attrition um, in that in that scenario assuming that your model includes all the all the predictors of um, of attrition and and that, as mark mentions these are very good ones and one we've looked at so uh, well you can see it those uh, those are important predictors of attrition uh, and so again, we include all participants. So even those participants who drop out, those are included in our estimation. Um, and so, so we address the attrition in that way. Okay, great. So I see Sean is uh, responding to Roberta's question. So I will jump to Harry's or yeah, Harry's question. So it says, thank you both for an informative talk regarding the conceptualization of social isolation. I wanted to know why you combined these three types of socialization to, social isolation together. This is given many studies have often found that loneliness is particularly associated with greater declining memory and worsening executive function in comparison to objective social isolation. Are there are there any follow-up plans to look at these types of social isolation individually? And then finally, have you considered doing a latent class analysis of social isolation to determine the patterning of social isolation in this sample? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I mean, Shauna has addressed that to some degree already. And I think, I can't remember if you mentioned this, but the, like a true loneliness measure wasn't introduced until the second wave of CLSA. Um, so it's possible with, with using additional data that could be done. Uh, the latent class analysis, so yeah, that's a great point. I mean, um, we, we use the measurement model and cognition, but there's nothing stopping, stopping someone from, from also doing a, a, a you know, proper formal measurement model of, um, of you know, this social isolation and, and what, kind of, uh, what kind of factors are underpinning that. Um, uh, so, it's certainly worthwhile doing, but we haven't we haven't done it. Okay, so uh, I see we've got one minute to go, so I'm just going to jump to what will be our last question uh, from. Okay, this is an interesting one uh, from Roberta talking about AI, obviously a very popular topic right now. What is your opinion regarding AI and its contribution for decreasing social mm -hmm. isolation, specifically friends or companionship uh, mm -hmm. from created AI bot to interact with? I mean, uh, I think this is great. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I think obviously face to face or like real people is definitely the way to go, but um, I know there's a lot of research, again, at UBC um, for people living in care homes with dementia who maybe don't have people coming to visit them and, and don't have as much support as they should on a mm -hmm. daily basis and using these iPads where they can call um, call their family and things like that. So I, I do think that there's a place for it. I don't think that we should rely on AI to, you know, play games with people and have conversations and, and kind of take out the human aspect. But I, I personally think it's a good way to support, especially in long-term care homes where they're already understaffed and, you know, it's better than nothing. 
is my opinion there. I, I would just add there, I read in the uh, the New York Times earlier this week, a uh, column by Kevin Roos that um, talks about this specific thing. So he's like a tech columnist for, for the New York Times and he befriended, uh, I don't know, a dozen or so um, AI chatbots and he talks about his experience with that. Um, yeah, so I mean, the, the gist was it's, you know, there's some promise, but it's not quite there yet. Great. Okay, so let me just pull my notes up here. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So we're right at time. I want to thank you both again for your very informative uh, and accessible presentation. I want to remind everyone that the next uh, data access deadline uh, for CLSA is July 10th, 2024. Uh, you can visit the CLSA website under data access to review the available data as well as additional details about how to apply. Um, and I would like to remind everyone when you exit the Zoom session, you will be prompted to answer a few feedback survey, uh, please take a few minutes and let us know how you enjoyed today's presentation. Um, so as you'll see on screen, our next webinar, which will be the final one um, of this, uh, uh, for this uh, webinar series, is Prevalence and Perpetrators of Elder Abuse in Canada, Does Victim Sexual Orientation Matter? And so again, we've got another SFU presenter, Dr. Gloria Gutman, who will join us on Wednesday, June 12th, 2024. Uh, so remember, uh, the registration details are posted on our website at CLSA. Uh, CLSA-ELCV.ca forward slash webinars. Uh, and you can remember, and also remember that CLSA promotes this webinar using the hashtag CLSA webinar series on uh, X. Uh, you can follow us at, um, at CLSA underscore dot ELCV. And again, thanks everyone. We really appreciate you joining us today.